we have this circuit here. What is the purpose of this circuit? Filter. It's a filter. And what type of filter? RC filter. It's an, it's an RC filter. And so we have these four types of filters. Let's say low pass, high pass, band pass, and, and uh, band stop. What type of filter is this? It's a, it should be a low pass filter because um, the R is independent of the frequency. So here, low and high frequencies can go through, but the impedance of the, the capacitance is, is 1 over j omega c. So for high frequencies, this is a low impedance. So high frequencies will be short circuit, will go back to ground, will not go to the load. But low frequencies cannot pass here, so low frequencies will go to the load. So it's a, it's a low pass filter. And so now the idea is um, we want to use as the input of this filter, we would like to use this pulse that uh, was that you looked at before, a single rectangular pulse, right, that we had from, uh, from this task here, from the Fourier transform tasks. So this shall be our input signal of the filter. And now the question is, what would be the output signal of the filter? And yeah, as it suggested here, so we can and we will solve it directly in time domain. But doing a calculation in time domain means we need to solve differential equations. And we are engineers, we are not mathematicians, so we don't like to solve differential equations. So one idea is, okay, we go into the frequency domain, um, we, we convert or we describe the system in frequency domain. This is what we will do later on. Yeah, and then we, we, we convert our time domain signal into frequency domain using this FFT algorithm. Then we do the calculation in frequency domain, and then we convert the response back into time domain. And this looks like a detour, let's say, on first glance. Yeah, uh, why not do it directly in time domain? Why, why to go into frequency domain? But we will see later on that this frequency domain calculation is much simpler and um, yeah, much more efficient, I won't say, but it's at the end it's simpler and it's more versatile and you could go for more complicated circuits, more difficult filters, more complicated signals and so on. So this is uh, much more handy at the end. Um, okay, and yeah, so these are the tasks. So let's start with task A and as usual, I will yeah, maybe just copy um, the circuit, put it into my drawing program that I've prepared here and maybe also copy these tasks. And maybe I should have copied everything at once, but um, maybe I can make this a little larger and I have more space to draw something in and maybe I will make this a little smaller um, so that it's still readable, but does not consume too much space here on the board. So task A, we should calculate and sketch the output voltage in time domain by solving the corresponding differential equation um, that describes this circuit. So first thing that we would need to do is somehow set up some differential equation. And to, to find this differential equation, um, yeah, we need to write down the laws that describe a circuit or that we use for circuit calculation. So what, what laws do you know for circuit calculation? I scalar. Say again? Uh, I scalar. Uh, no, I you, are you also, can, can, can you say it? I, 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 Right. Is I, I square R. Par, square into R. Current squared? Okay, current squared into R. M multiplied with R. Okay, this would give us power. Um, I will write it down. So power as a function of time would be current as a function of time multiplied with R. This would be the power loss into the resistor. So we could say, okay, this is the the current here is a function of time, 
But yeah, we are not really interested in the power, I would say. We know the input voltage because the input voltage, this is our rectangular pulse. And we want to know the output voltage here. This is the unknown function. So um, this is correct, but I think this won't help us. So other ideas. What other basic laws do you know to calculate electrical circuits? Kirchhoff's laws. And so there are two Kirchhoff's laws, one for the voltage and one for the current. So how can we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to this circuit? So I could write that the input voltage that we have from this node to this node along this way should be the same as Yeah, should, should be the, the voltage across the resistor as a function of time plus the voltage across the capacitor as a function of time and this is already the output voltage. So I could write the input voltage should be the same as the sum of the voltage across the resistance plus the output voltage. Okay. Um, great. So More, we, we don't have more Kirchhoff's voltage laws in the circuit. So we can continue with the Kirchhoff's current law. And what does Kirchhoff's current law here tell us? You want to say something? Yeah, so for example, we could write down okay. something for this and note here. IR equal to IC. And then it says IR is the same as IC. Yes. So this is, this is, and I will write down this as IR. Maybe I will add the, the R here. Um, can I delete here? No. Yeah, so this is IR of T. Um, and this is IC of T. And then someone said plus. No. Yeah. So we, we could have some current, okay. let's, let's say, that goes out here. Uh, I will maybe call it I2 of T, but it's somewhere said that it's open circuit. Yeah. And so um, I, will, I will formally write down, okay, we, we might have some output current, but we say zero. this is zero due to the open circuit condition. Okay, now we have a Kirchhoff's voltage law, we have a Kirchhoff's current law. So this gives us a relation between Voltages, this gives us a relation between currents. So um, what, what, what else do we need to do a meaningful circuit calculation? We, we need, for example, Ohm's law. So we need something that uh, gives us a relation between current and voltage at the respective elements. And for the, for the resistor, we can write down U R of T is the same as R times the current. Or we could also rearrange it in a different way and say the current as a function of time is the same as the voltage divided by the resistance, right? Okay, so this is for the resistor. Um, what do we use or need for the capacitor? So we can say UC of T is I, I, I uh, D, you are Yeah, so so wait. So we will write it down in the opposite way. We will say I C is C D U C or D U to output voltage, um, the time derivative of the output voltage to the, yeah, or the time derivative. So this gives us the current. If I would like to write down the equation in the opposite order, 
Well, what should I get? One by C. Yeah, one by C, and then Integrate. time integrated uh, time integration or the current through the capacitor integrated over time. And so, as we can see, this equation is not super handy because it would lead us to some integral equation, and we don't want to have an integral equation. We want to have a differential equation. So that's why it's better to use this equation here. Um, so now we can check. Um, we can check and count a little bit. We th this is a known quantity. Um, so maybe I will mark something here. This is what is known. And unknown is this voltage, this voltage, um, this current, and this current. And so we have the same current and the same voltage in here and the same current and the same voltage in here. Um, so we have four unknowns and we also have four equations. Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law, Ohm's law and uh, the law from the capacitor. And yeah, so from this point of view it also makes sense. As so this is the very same equation as this one and this is the very same equation as this one. But Okay, we have four unknowns, we have four equations. Should be should be possible to solve. And yeah, so now next step would be we need to turn these four equations with four unknowns into one equation with one unknown. So any ideas how to do this? Yeah, so we could Put this into here, yeah. for example. This is what you suggest. Okay, let's 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 try to do this. So we get then u one of t is r times this uh, plus our output voltage. Yes. And okay, and so now now let's say we we so this is what we could cross because we have already used this equation. So it probably would not make more sense to use this equation because then we would get back to the original um, thing. Okay. And replace IR with IC because IR equals IC. Yeah. And now we can, we can use that the currents here are the same. So we can use Kirchhoff's current law and then also insert, um, not, not cross this, insert, insert this into here, right? Say the current through the resistance is the same as the current through the capacitor and the capacitor, cur uh, capacitor current we will insert here at this position. So we get input voltage is the same as R times C times the time derivative of the output voltage plus the output voltage. And now we have derived a differential equation because there's just one unknown in this equation. It's the output voltage, the input voltage we know, and we have these uh, two constants R and C, the values of our parameters. And as we can see, it's a first order differential equation because we have the function itself and the first derivative. And it's a linear differential equation because we just have the function and the, the time derivative, no square of the function, something like this. And it's a um, um, differential equation with constant coefficients because R and C do not depend on time. Unfortunately, it's an inhomogeneous differential equation because we have this other side. Uh, if this side would be zero, then it would be a homogeneous differential equation. And still this, so let's say first order linear differential equation with constant coefficients is kind of the most simplest um, differential equation that you can solve or that we can solve. Now the question is, how do we solve it? And also, hello to the six people watching on Twitch. If you have any ideas, write them into the chat. So th th there's an idea, there's a big idea how to, how to solve it. Or does anyone have an idea how to solve this differential equation? How would you do it? I honestly use frequency domain. You use frequency <laughs> domain. No one, use, no one uh, calculates it in a time no. domain. But I would like to calculate it in a time domain because this is, let's say, the exact way and then you don't have any artifacts. If we go into frequency domain, we will see, then we always get... We, we, 
we, we, we, can, we can have mistakes there. So, um, yeah, th there's maybe one idea. Yeah, the yeah we, we, at first we start with the homogeneous. Yes. So we, we say, let's, let's set this to zero. We start with the homogeneous equation. And I will uh, shorten the notation a little bit. I will say u2 dot is the time derivative and u2 is the first or is the function itself. Okay, so this is now the homogeneous differential equation. And why it's okay, why it's allowed to set the source to zero uh, and to solve the homogeneous differential equation first because we then get like the own solution of our circuit. Um, what, what would the circuit do for itself if we would have no excitation? Or if we had an excitation, how does the, uh, the circuit respond to this excitation? That's the idea of this homogeneous equation, homogeneous differential equation. Okay, so the next question is, okay, how do we solve this homogeneous differential equation? Yeah, you could, yeah, this would be some, let's say, trivial solution. But still, there would be a solution without that u2 is always zero. And so we can look at this a little bit and say, okay, here's the function, right? And here's the first time derivative of this function multiplied with a certain factor. And the function itself and the first time derivative of the function, they together, for every time step, they always should be zero. And so for this to happen, of course, the function itself and the first time derivative of the function, they somehow need to be equal because otherwise they cannot be zero together. Yeah, so if this is positive and this is similar but negative, then they can, can always sum up to zero. So now the question is, which function do we know where the function itself and the first time derivative are equal? For which function it's the case that the function itself and the first time derivative are equal, somehow equal, so that they could function plus or minus the time derivative, let's say, um, gives us zero. Which, for which function it's the case that you, you have the function, you take, calculate the first time derivative, and then it's, it's once again the same function as before. And it's, yeah, it's a, fun it's a function that because of this is that we see in many applications and for many purposes uh, in electrical engineering, but also in other, in mechanical engineering. And because it's, it's the solution of this first order differential equation. And if someone watching it online has some idea what function would solve and fulfill the condition of this first order differential equation. Please write it into the chat. Is it uh, like that? Uh, the input and output is the same? No, no, input and output will not be the same. Input and output because we have this filtering effect. It's not if we would have a resistor and a resistor here, then input and output would be the same, but um, it's a low pass filter. So the output would change. E yeah, it's some exponential function because if you have an exponential function, if you calculate the derivative of an exponential function, you once again get an exponential function. So our approach is to say, to assume that u2, our unknown function u2 of t, is some exponential function that depends on time. Because if you would calculate the time derivative of this, this again would be some exponential function. Okay, so now the thing is, um, would this work if I write down, okay, u2 is e to the power of t? And why, and okay, it's a rhetorical question. It does not work. <laughs> why, but why does it not work? Why, why, why can I not uh, write down e to the power of t and this gives us the voltage? t is the time. The time has which unit? Second, for example. So 
if we would calculate e2 one second, does it work? No, because we can only calculate e to the power of a number, but not e to the power of a unit. So we need something here in front of the t that, so if t has the unit second, then this lambda should have the unit one over second, so that the units will cancel each other, we get something unitless, something dimensionless, and we can calculate e to the power of a number. No problem. And if we calculate e to the power of a number, what do we get? We get a number. But what do we want to have at the end? Voltage. We want to have a voltage. So the number has no units, still we want to have something in volt. So what do we do? We, we have to multiply with, some, with another constant that let's, let's call this k, and the unit of this k is volt. And then it perfectly makes sense with the proper units inside this equation. And so this would one be one way to, to say why, why do we need these coefficients um, and these, um, the units inside this equation. And there's also another reason why we might have or why it's a good idea to have a constant before the exponential function and why do we have a constant inside the argument of this exponential function. Um, because, um, so yeah, we have this differential equation and we somehow need to adapt our solution to this differential equation. We, we somehow need to, let's scale, scale it, make it, make it fit our equation. So from a graphical point of view, from a geometrical point of view, what does this factor k do here? It's a voltage, but if you, so you have a function and you write a factor in front of the function. What does a factor, um, a multiplication factor in front of a function do with the function? From a gra graphical point of view. No, it's not. Yeah, it's it's nah, not really. It yeah, it's it it somehow also belongs depends on the starting value. But I I I, I would have another function. Uh, I have something sine of omega t, and now I write something before the sine function, or I have x square as a function, and I write something before the x square. What, what does what does a factor in front of the function do with the function? It scales, exactly. It scales the function in vertical direction. The larger the k, the larger will be my function. And the smaller the k, the smaller will be my function. So with this k, I can scale the function vertically. So what does this lambda do? So uh, now I have a fa factor that is multiplied with the time. It's maybe how long from before. Yeah, so it scales, it, it uh, expands and shrinks the function in the horizontal direction. Yeah. And so with these two factors, right, the lambda scales in this direction and the k scales in this direction, we can make our solution fit um, to our problem, to our equation. And this is also the reason why we need to have these two factors in there, inside the solution. Okay, so this is what we can insert there. And um, yeah, so here we also need the first time derivative of this function, this u2 dot. So how can we calculate from this the first time derivative? So the... Um, the, t the derivative of the exponential function the is the same, it's the exponential function. So then you say multiply with? E. Oh, sorry, lambda. Multiply with lambda because it's a nested function. We have something in the argument, so we mean to multiply, and what do we do with the k? Just, just copy it because it's a constant factor, we just um, copy it to this. Okay. So then, yeah, maybe I can, um, yeah, I think I'm, I, I need to move to a second page. So 
let's see if I can copy this one here and oops, uh, insert it here, right? Okay, and so now into this equation, we will insert what we have just written. So R times C, now the time derivative was K times E to lambda T multiplied with lambda. And our original solution was just the K times E to lambda T. And this should still be zero. And this is the so-called um, characteristic equation of this problem. And from this characteristic equation, we can find the value of lambda. And how do we do this? Any ideas? How can we rearrange this formula into lambda or to, to give us lambda? Yeah, not really. I mean, we have the we have the lambda here, and we also have it inside this exponential function. But let's rearrange this formula to give us this lambda. So we take this this term to the other side. Uh, so we take minus k times e two lambda t, and so then it looks like that um, here we have k times e2 lambda t and on the other side and minus of yes, course yes, lambda minus RC. yeah and here we have still rc and the same k and lambda thing here and lambda and so if we want to if we still want to have lambda what do we do divide, divide by whatever is here in front so we divide by um, yeah, divide by, by, by this term and so then we get lambda is um, now I will I will write it down minus k times e to lambda t divided yeah and so we can or maybe I could also just cancel it um, yeah. so we, we or le let's let's maybe write it down here so we can divide by k and we can also divide by this exponential function. Um, because k should not be zero. If k would be zero, the function would be zero. It does not make sense. And the exponential function is also never zero. And because of this, we can divide by them. If, if k could be zero, if the exponential function could be zero, then it would be not such a good idea to divide by them. But in this case, it's no problem. We can divide. So say again. Okay. So we can also directly cancelled here or we could have also directly let's say cancelled it here on top um, and so lambda as already said is minus 1 over rc right if I I also here then need to divide by rc and then we get here some 1 is left and we get lambda as minus 1 over rc now we could do a quick check and say okay the unit that we would like to have for this lambda was frequency. was frequency or was one over second so um, here we see we have the we have a resistance and we have capacitance the unit of the resistance is ohm, ohm and ohm can also be written as Uh, remember Ohm's law that we had before? Yeah, voltage, voltage, voltage divided by current. Uh, yeah, or resistance voltage divided by current. Ohm I can also write as 1 volt divided by 1 ampere or volt per ampere. So what is the unit of the capacitance? Coulomb. Yeah, Coulomb. Coulomb yeah. is the unit of the, ch of the charge. Yeah. This is Farad, and Farad is Coulomb divided by voltage. So this is Coulomb divided by volt, and Coulomb 
is ampere second because it's charged. So I can also here write it's one ampere second divided by volt. And so now if I if I insert this into this equation here and for the resistance I write the unit of the resistance which is volt divided by ampere mm. and for the capacitance I write ampere second divided by volt then volt and volt and ampere and ampere will cancel each other and I will get once again one over second uh, but I've already written this down here so this nicely makes sense yeah, that we need to have this RC exactly in this way into this lambda there to get the unit one over second in this case Okay, um, so we know lambda. We, we, we know lambda in our approach. So the remaining thing that we need to know is the k, this k factor. So how do we get k? Any ideas how to get K? Someone said in between this is something like the starting value. Yeah, it should be U0. Yeah, and the, and the starting value, um, this is a question. Yeah, so um, if we go back to the task somewhere, which is I think here, uh, then uh, I'm not sure if it's written somewhere. Um, but we, we would assume that the capacitor is uncharged at the beginning. I think it's unfortunately never not really written somewhere here. But our, our initial condition, so we have some, some initial condition. And the initial condition is that the, the output voltage at the time zero is also zero, that the capacitor is uncharged. Okay, so this initial condition will, will help us to find um, this k value, but <laughs> We, we still have only solved the homogeneous differential equation. We would somehow need to go back to the, to the um, inhomogeneous differential equation and find the solution for this inhomogeneous differential equation. And yeah, any ideas for this? And so one, one way to do it um, is to look what would happen what would happen in our circuit, let's stay on this side. So um, what would happen to our output voltage if time goes to infinity? And so in this case, uh, we, should, we should take a look just at switching on this pulse. So we will switch on and then it will stay on. And we wait for very long time. What, should we, what would we get at the output in this case? Say again? Infinity. Nah, do we get in infinite voltage at the output? No. Not really. So if we wait long enough, so we, we can also look at our equations. If we wait long enough, our output voltage should not change anymore. Mm. And if, so the output voltage is constant. If the output voltage is constant, the time derivative mm -hmm. will be zero. Mm. And this means the current will be zero. So it means this current will be zero. This means also the current through the resistor will be zero. And if the current through the resistor is zero, also the voltage across, the voltage drop across the resistor will be zero. Which means if this is zero, that the output voltage is the same as the input voltage. So here we will get this U zero. We will get this one volt. We will get if, we, if, this, if this pulse is long enough and we wait long enough, then finally we will get the input voltage at the output. Okay, so um, with this, uh, let me go back to the second page. 
So with this, we can f we can write down some um, yeah some full solution or some complete solution. And the complete solution would be that we say, okay, our output function as a function of time is k times e2 lambda t. We, we already know lambda. And then plus this u0 that we just got from here. Okay, and so the remaining thing in there that we still need to calculate is the k. And this k we get from the initial condition. Because the initial condition tells us at the beginning the capacitor, capacitor should be uncharged. And so if we, if we write down this formula here um, for the time zero, then there would be k times e2 lambda times zero. I've inserted zero for the time plus this u0 plus the amplitude of our input voltage. And um, yeah, e to the power of zero is one. one. And if this should be zero at the end, what does it mean for our k? Yeah, k, k should be minus u zero. And so we can insert here k is minus u0, so we get minus u0 multiplied with e2 lambda t plus u0. And so we can rearrange this a little bit and say, okay, it's u0 multiplied with 1 minus e2 lambda t. And instead of lambda, I will now insert r and c. And then this is the solution. This is the exact time domain solution, what will happen to the output voltage in this simple circuit if we have if we have a step if we have a step function at the input. And as you can see it took us some time to calculate the solution even if it was a very simple circuit even if it's a very simple signal. So you can imagine if the circuit is a little more complicated and if the signal is a little more complicated, then it's, it gets almost impossible to do it. Because we don't up end up with one differential equation, we might get a system of differential equations and so on. And it will be very challenging to solve this task. Okay, but we have now found an exact solution, at least for the charging. And for the discharging, we could check. Um, so this is, let's say this is charging. And for discharging, uh, we will get something similar. Um, so um, I will use another constant, u with a hat, um, and then just multiply it with e minus trc. You could just derive this by, um, yeah, but it's, it's the very same solution that we used before for our homogeneous differential equation. Um, so this would be charging, this would be discharging, and um, this, the, the maximum voltage that we, that we get, let me see if I can write this uh, without writing over my camera window here, the maximum voltage uh, yeah, looks good. The would be um, would be our our charging. So let's call this maybe charge charge function of the time, and this is discharge here. And so if we into our charging function, if we do this for the time that is equal to the pulse width to tau, we'll, according to our task. Um, right, so if after one microsecond, um, we, we insert this into the function and we would get the maximum voltage and then it's discharging. So maybe now before we go into frequency domain, maybe what, what we can do, uh, maybe what we should do is um, somehow plot this solution or, or draw this solution 
or get some idea how this looks like. So I will uh, maybe copy this here and put it onto another slide. And let's try to draw this. So I will draw a schematic. Um, this is the voltage axis. Ooh. Let me, oh, something strange happens here. Um, I accidentally pushed some button on the pen. I should not have done this. Okay, so how, how can I disable it once again? I think now. Okay, so this should be the voltage axis and this should be the time axis. This is time, this is our output voltage and we can also um, maybe in a different color plot the input voltage. So the input voltage, if we have our pulse is zero, then we jump up to the one volt U0, one volt amplitude that we have here, then this voltage stays constant for the pulse period tau and then it's zero once again. So this would be our input pulse. And now we would get, we would like to get the output. This is what I will draw in green here. So if we have no input, of course we have no output. And at this point here, we start to charge our capacitor and we have this charging curve. So question is, how does this exponential function look like if we plot it? You, you suggest something like this, but this would mean that the voltage across the capacitor would jump up and the voltage across the capacitor is proportional to the charge. And this would mean that the charge would jump. And this is not physical because the charge is, um, something that, that cannot jump. You can, you can only move charges from one place to, to another place, but um, charge cannot rapidly change the position. We are charging. We are charging. And like if it's one tau, it should be like 68% of the charge. Yeah, um, and the, the, the question is how does the curve look like? So, um, you are right, if we would just plot this exponential function, um, so let's have another diagram here, small sketch. Um, so let's call just this X and Y. And if we, if we would just plot E to X, how, how would this look like? This would increase. Uh, this would look like this, that for zero we have one and for one we have E. And E, as I have learned recently, is approximately 2.718. Um, and this is our exponential function. And remember what we told before, <coughs> that the derivative of this exponential function is the exponential function. And the question is, what does taking a derivative mean from a graphical point of view? Okay. What, what, what does it mean to calculate a derivative from a graphical point of view? If I, I, I have a function, um, and I want to get the derivative of this function. What does taking a derivative means? T taking a derivative mean? We, you, you said before when we talked about the integral that it's the, the area below the curve. So the, yeah, the meaning of calculating some integral, it's the area below the curve and um, a, a derivative means Exactly, we look at the slope. So if we look at the slope here at the beginning, the slope is very small. And, and the function is very small. 
And so if we go along, along the function, what happens with the slope? It increases. it increases and the function increases. And if we are at this point, the slope here is approximately or is exactly one and the function is one. And if we continue to go along the function and the slope increases and increases and the function also increases. And this is why the exponential function looks like this exponential function uh, looks like this way because it's the only function that we have where the first derivative of the function is the same as the function itself. You can also see it at the schematic, right? That the slope is always equal to the function. The time derivative is equal to the function itself. Okay, so now we don't have e to e to x, we have e to minus x. So how does e to minus x look like? It's, it's mirrored along the y-axis, right? It's we, we all positive x values get negative and all negative x values get positive and so on. And the function looks like this. Yeah, no, no, not super nice, but okay. So now we have not e to minus x, we have minus e to minus x. So how does this look like? It will be mirrored along the x-axis. Everything will be negative. Ah, and uh, th there's, um, I, I just seen it. So the Galva Bart wrote into the chat the slope of the tangent. Exactly, this is the, this is the time derivative. So now we mirror along the x-axis. And so now this should be at the position minus one. And so finally in gray, if we say we want to have one minus e to minus x, what do we get or what, what does change? It's like it's the same as e2 minus e2 minus x plus one. What does the plus one do? It shifts everything up. It shifts everything up by one. So instead of minus one, we cross it here at zero. And instead of approaching zero, we approach the one. So our curve looks like this. This is the exponential curve. And so this is what we get here um, in green. So we get exponential charging. And it would, would continue and approach this curve here. And as you said, we have some time constant um, that I cannot really call tau now, but we have this um, yeah, or let's call it tau rc, which is just r times c, what, what we have here in our function. And um, yeah, but wh wh where do we find, where we would we find this tau in our curve here? You, you, had, you, you said something with uh, percent? Yeah. yeah, so if we say e is uh, 2.72, let's say, then um, here at this position, the value that we have here is 1 over e, and 1 over e is 0 0.37. And so here we also have minus, uh, so very dense sketches, so here we have minus 0 0.37, and so now if we add 1, the 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 value that we have here is 1 plus this, and this is 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.63, right? This is what you, what you mentioned. Exactly. And so wherever we reach 63% um, of our end value, which might be the case here, this is the place where we have this tau RC. Or what you could also do is you could write a tang tangent, ta tangent, I don't know how to, English is very difficult. So we talked about German before about the pronunciation, but from my point of view, English is, so in German, you write it in a way, it's pronounced in a way. Um, and there are not so many different ways to pronounce it, but in English, it's very, I, I would not know if it's, do you say it? Tangent or ta tangent. Ta tangent? Okay. 
So if, if we write a tangent along this curve from, from this point to wherever the tangent hits the asymptotic value, this is one time constant. And then you could continue here and say, okay, if I, if I would draw another tangent along the curve, wherever the tangent hits the asymptotic value, this would be another time constant and so on and so on. And so here we, this is the point where we reach our maximum voltage that we calculated before here, the U with the head on top. And from there we are discharging. And discharging is just the uh, E two minus X or E two minus T curve that we had before with the same time constant. So it would go down like this. And so this is what we expect. We have some perfect rectangular pulse at the input And at the output, we get exponential charge, exponential charging, exponential discharging uh, due to our circuit, due to um, our low pass filter. And so if we go back to this, so now we have finished A. We have calculated and sketched the output voltage in time domain by solving differential equation. And we get a perfectly nice exact solution. Um, and it's, that's the advantage, it's perfectly accurate. But the disadvantage is the way to there was quite challenging and complicated. So let's continue with the next task here. Maybe I will once again use green for this. So calculate the voltage transfer function in the frequency domain. And for this, I will go back here and once again copy the circuit and have another um, sketchbook here on the fourth page. Insert this, maybe once again make it a little larger. So now we want to go for this part B and want to write down a voltage transfer function in frequency domain. So instead of the time function, I will write here, this is a complex phaser. Instead of this here, I will also write a complex phaser. And the complex phasers might depend on frequency or on angular frequency omega. Okay, and so now the question is, according to the task, how can we calculate this ratio between output voltage and input voltage complex phasers as a function, um, yeah, as a, like a transfer function in frequency domain. Any, any ideas? Laplace. Well, yeah, with something like Laplace um, would be possible. I would say it's maybe, uh, as we always say, shooting on sparrows with cannons. Also, uh, Singing? I, I, yes, it's too, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the transfer function. This is what we would call transfer function. So, but it, what is on the other side of this transfer function? And to, 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 to uh, maybe help you a little bit, um, this is our output voltage, this is the input voltage. If I would re redraw the circuit a little bit, here's the resistor, here's the capacitor. Um, this is the input voltage and this here is the output voltage between these two terminals. Um, yeah, so if you have this circuit, we know this voltage, we want to know this voltage. How we can calculate this voltage from this voltage in this circuit? Voltage divider. It's a voltage divider, exactly. So we can use a voltage divider. And what does the voltage divider rule tell us? Uh, total voltage. Um, U2 equal to U1 into... Yeah, so what, what do I need to write here on the other side of my equation here? Or you would... Uh, yeah, U1, the, the sum of U2, uh, in the upper side, U1. In the upper side, U1, you, you yeah, but I have U1 already here. Um, 
Any other ideas? It's not like the, uh, the upper part is like U R. No, it's U two uh, divided by the comma. Yeah. yeah. So here we have. Um, yeah. Let's let's call this U R. Um, yeah u r of omega and this is u2 and so it's a series circuit in the series circuit we have the same current each and everywhere so if i would write down an ohm's law to calculate this voltage here from the current what would i do No, no, I, just just some Ohm's law in this case. I I have I have the current. How can I calculate from this from the current this voltage? Say say something. <laughs> you have to multiply for the impedance. Yeah, we the take we take the impedance. Uh, we have the impedance here the impedance of the capacitor and if we take the impedance multiply with the current we get the voltage and we could do the same here and say okay this is also resistance multiplied by current and so okay now we could insert this here and say okay our output voltage is current times this impedance across the capacitor and for the input voltage, we could also write, okay, the input voltage, as we've done before, is UR of omega plus U2 of omega. Once again, Kirchhoff's voltage law. And so if we insert this here, we get current times resistance plus current times impedance of the, of the capacitor. And so wh what can I do in this equation now? Cancel the currents. And so finally we get that it's Zc divided by R plus Zz. And this is a voltage divider rule. The partial voltage to the total voltage is the same as the partial impedance divided by the total impedance. Okay. Um, so maybe what we should do, what we could do, what we should do is what is the impedance of the capacitor? One over, J one over J omega C. And there is a comment in the chat. Um, U2 is U1 minus UR. Yes, this is correct, but I think the U2 um, yeah, if we insert this, it won't, will not really help us here in this case uh, to, um, to find this ratio or this transfer function because then on this side, once again, we would have the U1. Um, so it, it, writing it down like this as the voltage divider is much, much better. So now we can take this, right, and insert it here at this position and also insert it at this position. And then we get that our output voltage divided by the input voltage is the same as uh, one over J omega C divided by R plus one over J omega C. And so this formula does not look that nice because we have this double fraction, how to get rid of this. One, Ex one expa time. expand by j omega c yeah, so if we expand here with this j omega c we we get one and one and we get exactly one plus j, j omega r c and yeah if we take a short look on this this perfectly makes sense because r and c together have which unit uh, time and time multiplied with frequency is unitless 
And so we have unitless plus something unitless is unitless. And so this all makes sense from looking at the units. And the other thing is uh, that what, what was the purpose of this filter? What should, should have been the purpose of the filter? A low pass filter. Mm -hmm. So if we have low frequencies, if our omega is small, then we get just one over one. Low frequencies get through, no problem. Our transfer function is one. If we have high frequencies, yeah, yeah the, the higher the frequency, the larger is this term here. And then we have one over something large. So our transfer function gets small. And the higher the frequency, the larger this term, the smaller the output, right? Okay, so this is also really the transfer function of a, of a low pass filter.